Next, a simple one. A child presents with a pupillary reflex, which you can see from birth, like this whitish reflex. Remember, the normal red glow is normal. Patient has trabismus also, means has a squint also. On CT scan, a calcificus indiami. You've given you so many clues that it's impossible to get the answer wrong. And a cauliflower like growth is seen in direct on indirect ophthalmoscopy. What could the diagnosis? And ladies and gentlemen, you do not have to read the choices also. Straight away, you have to look straight away for choice number B which is retinoblastoma. There are so many clues. First, we get the leukocoria, the white pupil reflex. Second, they had squint also, which is the second commonest presentation of retinoblastoma after leukocoria is squint. Third, you see calcification. And that is the most important sign because it is the calcification which is appears to us as the white colored pupil. The leukocoria is because of the calcification, is not? And on fourth, you can see a cauliflower-like growth, which is the typical look of retinoblastoma in direct ophthalmoscopy. So the answer is retinoblastoma. So please remember multiple signs of leukocoria, which you can see in the first picture, you see the white pupil and that white pupil appears as the calcification. But remember, you can have other differential diagnosis of white pupil children also is not. So see this child also has a white pupil, but this is not retinoblastoma. It is congenital cataracts. So kindly remember the three most common differential diagnosis of white pupils and this is another child who also has leukocoria, but this is, is Coats disease, okay? Coats disease, please remember, is the second commonest cause of leukocoria in children after retinoblastoma. So once you've ruled out retinoblastoma, number two is Coats, and then we have to think of a congenital cataract, which can also produce a white pupil. So these are the three important different diagnoses of leukocoria, and I dare say that all of you have got this right. A middle-aged patient, presence to with bilateral ptosis, lids are down, which varies diurnally, which means that the ptosis increases or decreases according to the time of the day and becomes more symptomatic in the evening dear me. So you've got the answer as the ptosis basically worsens in the evening, is it not? And what does that tell you? It's called lid fatigability or we call it fatigable ptosis or we also call it a fluctuating ptosis which increases in the evening and improves with the ice pack test again, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to look at the choice also, you have to just look for the answer, which is C for Calcutta here. Myasthenia gravis, which you know, the myasthenia gravis has two important groups of people, the young ladies and old men, so middle-aged patient with bilateral ptosis. Ptosis usually bilateral, could be unilateral also. And it's the first presentation of my ocular myasthenia because LPS is the first muscle to get damaged in myasthenia. Where is Danielly? This is the clue. This fluctuation with worsening of the ptosis in the evening is very typically seen in myasthenia and improves the ice pack. It's because when you put an ice pack, remember, as you cool the neuromuscular junction, it improves the electrical transmission. Okay. So, by cooling the neuromuscular, so when you put an ice pack on the lids, closed lids, for about two minutes, you can see that. Look at the ptosis here, and we put it for about two minutes, and immediately following that, you can see the ptosis improves immediately. A resolution of more than two millimeter means that the ptosis is improved, and this is the diagnostic test. This is almost as equally effective as the Tensilon test. In fact, this is more useful to us because this is more safe. Tensilon is a little unsafe. We cannot always do tensile on test in a bedside, but we can always do the perform the ice pack test. The answer is myasthenia. I hope you all this correct. See, remember these are all questions taken from the last few years of PYQs, previously asked questions. The test shown in the image. So let's look at the test. First picture is just two eyes. Second, we have put some kind of occluder there. And third, we've taken it off again. So we see the difference in the, as you put an occluder, occluder means occluding the eye. The position of the eye has gone inwards, okay? That's gone inwards. So, this is isotropia. Why has it gone inwards? Because it takes a normal position. When the eyes are closed, that means the eye is normal resting position. In the resting position, the eye goes to normal position, which in this case is moved inwards, isotropia. So, this is a test for squint. But as we take the cover off, we find the eyeball comes to its normal position, which looks straight to the right. And the answer here, ladies and gentlemen, is choice A. The cover uncovered test which picks up the phorias. Remember, phorias are squints which cannot be seen directly because they are latent, they are hidden. So, when you close the eye with an occluder or a cover like this, so what do you do? You break the fusion. The fusion keeps the two eyes together. So, in normal gaze, in a phoria, eyes are parallel because the fusion has kept the two eyes together. 
The minute you put the cover on, it breaks the fusion. I move to normal position, which is an isotrope here in this particular picture. So it's broken the fusion. And as you remove the cover, immediately the eyeball moves back to its normal position to look at the light. So this is how the cover and cover test. It is performed like this and picks up. So what you do when you cover this eye, so you, you cannot see what's happening behind the eyes, not behind the cover because it is opaque. When you take off the cover, look at the position of the eye. If it is straight, if it looks, it looks straight at you, it means there is no squint. But if it moves from in to out, it moves from out to in. If it moves from in to outwards, as you move the cover, it means he has an exotropia. If you move out to in, it means he has an exotropia. If there is no movement, there is no squint at all. Okay, so this is the cover and cover test, which you must have guessed by the way we have framed the question. Very well. Next question. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are basically doing some PYQs and then we'll go to some other things which are a conglomerate of all the things that we expect in your paper this time. A firm payment nodule, you can see it here, on the upper lid of a patient of 30 years of age with the prominence away from the lid margin is most likely to be, and those of you have seen the and seen these pictures repeatedly that I have flashed them, you recognize them, it's not a sty, it's not a squamous cell carcinoma in a 30 year old patient, it's unlikely and it is indeed a chalazion, it's a chalazion which is a chronic inflammatory granuloma of the mewoman glands, is it not? So this is a painless nodule as I mentioned here, see why it's not a sty? Because a sty would have been painful, so this is a painless, this is neither the internal hodulum, again very very painful. So this is a painless nodule which gives you an opulent typical position of a chalazion which is a chronic inflammatory granuloma of the bovine glands. Okay, remember chalazion and the question that we like to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, you have to be careful about this, that when we ask chalazion, remember an important differential diagnosis happens to be a sebaceous cell carcinoma. Now if the question had been a, say a 60 year old lady, sebaceous carcinoma because women mostly, older women and a similar form painless nodule which looks a bit like this and which is often mistaken for a chalazion, okay, is actually a very dangerous thing called a sebaceous cell carcinoma and you can see it here, look at that. This old gentleman as you can see and this is, uh, looks just like a chalazion but it's not a chalazion, it's not a chalazion, it's actually a sebaceous cell carcinoma which can be extremely malignant, extremely malignant and very dangerous. So remember a differential diagnosis of a recurrent chalazion in older women is likely to be a Sebaceous cell carcinoma. After all, remember, chalazion is a chronic inflammatory granuloma of mewoman glands, and the mewoman glands are nothing but modified sebaceous glands. So, a sebaceous cell carcinoma can very well attack the mewoman glands. Okay, very well. A child with low socioeconomic background that gives you a hint of some deficiency, because with foamy white spots and dear me, this is so obvious on both temporal conjunctiva, not one but both. What could the vitamin deficiency be? And you know, these are classically bitered spots, and bitered spots are a very specific sign of vitamin A deficiency. So, it is indeed choice A, vitamin A deficiency, bitered spots are very specifically one shot of vitamin A injection, and bitered spots disappear in about two weeks. They have been literally melt away, so to say, like snow in exposed to hot sun. So, this is bitered spots, so we know by the look that's a vitamin deficiency, okay. So the answer is a very simple one, one of the simple questions and but you do need to have some simple questions. Because remember this is the guess the paper and your paper does have some simple questions and mixed up with a few difficult ones and mixed up with some middle difficulty questions. Then a three year old boy presents to you with itching and red eyes which is more in summer, remember summer madness, not summer of 62, summer madness and this is also ropey discharge from the eyes, there's a lot of clues here. What is the probable diagnosis? If you look at the pictures, you see some giant flat top things here and this, you know, we call them as giant papillary conjunctivitis. Remember, these are papillae, but remember the answer is not GPC because the size of the papillae tells us, remember we call them giant papillae. How do you know a papillae first? Because they are flat topped, they are reddish, they are velvety and you know papillae are seen in allergic conditions. When they are more than one millimeter in size, we call them giant papillae. The normal papillae are less than 0.3 millimeter in size, okay. When they're more than one, we call them giant papillae. So it is, it could be GPC, it could also be spring catar. Both of them have giant papillae, remember. And by looking at the giant papillae, you cannot make out whether it is due to GPC or whether because of 
spring katar but the answer here is spring katar simply because the red and itching eyes which is more in summer in a small child okay remember they are seen in children particularly boys particularly in summer where they start itching their eyes so giant paprika and why it is not the answer because giant paprika even though they look the same they uh, this is gpc but this is seen in contact lens wear please remember the the kind of findings that we find here the big papillae giant papillae more than 1 mm papillae can be seen in both spring catar as well as gpc but gpc will see in a contact lens wear history and spring catar will be seen in a young boy who in, in complains of itching in hot weather so the finding is spec not specific for both of them they are similar in both gpc as well as spring catar but the history tells us the spring catar but be careful when you have a contact lens where the diagnosis will become gpc mark the correct disease for the given and this is a disease which a image has been repeated 100 times in the last few years you all know the famous dendritic ulcer this is the viral keratitis remember the other question could be here this is the dendritic ulcer because it look like the branches of a tree which means dendrites also it could be a geographic ulcer because remember dendro geographic ulcer and the second question what is the stain we have used here is the fluorescein stain and third question often asked now is what is the blue filter we have used in the slit lamp is a cobalt blue filter the cobalt blue filter okay so the answer is viral keratitis multiple questions what kind of filter are using the cobalt blue what kind of stain fluorescein dye we are using dendritic ulcer or viral keratitis is the correct answer a one eyed person got hit by a punch and only i dear me that's really sad following which he experienced diplopia what can the cause of this be remember so it cannot is not binocular diplopia remember when you have both eyes the double vision with both eyes cause binocular diplopia and i have told you umpteen times that the first and the most common cause of binocular diplopia is squint so this is a uniocular diplopia but why is he having it because you can see here look at that there is a tearing of the iris away from the insertion to the ciliary body which is called as iridodialysis so the answer is iridodialysis and why is he having diplopia is having monocular diplopia because now he has almost two different pupils one the pupil which is hair the original pupil which is becoming a d shaped pupil another question in iridodialysis is the answer iridodialysis and this is the dialysis and this also acts as a pupil this also acts as a pupil so since there are two light rays going through the one through the normal pupil other through the pseudo pupil so to say created by the iridodialysis so the patient is having monocular diplopia the answer you can see clearly the d shaped pupil is gentlemen you can see the d shaped pupil you can see it here and you can see so these two are forming like a dual pupil like a double kind of pupil one ray passing through this the other light passing through this and that is why they have monocular diplopia so remember iridodialysis can lead to a monocular diplopia the answer is iridodialysis here okay very well then a boy was hit by a cricket ball while playing and next morning he presented with a headache diplopia looking up and in of thalamus who is the one responsible for this fracture of the roof of the orbit fracture of the floor of the orbit a subdural hematoma an intracranial hemorrhage and all of you must have got this right is the fracture of the floor of the orbit which is the most commonly fractured floor this is called a blowout fracture where the most commonly fractured wall of the orbit is the floor is it not and how do i know because he has the trial of diplopia and looking up because the inferior rectus got trapped in the fracture wall and is not allowing the eyeball to move up and in ophthalmos is a well known sign remember the classic die okay diplopia infarb lanesthesia in ophthalmos the sign of blood fracture and you see this is what is happening this eye is looking up it is perfectly normal but this eye is trying to look up is not able to go up because inferior rectus muscle has got entrapped in the floor fracture the floor floor the floor of the orbit has fractured and trapped the inferior rectus muscle so it's not able to contract or relax and not that is why the eyeball is not able to follow that is why he has diplopia on looking upwards and that was the hint which is the fracture of the floor of the orbit okay which is also if you all remember is the most common fracture of the the wall most common wall to fracture in orbit is the inferior wall next question ladies and gentlemen and this is a good question i like this identify the step of cataract so is given to me see what you doing is against a red glow 
you are pulling some kind of a thing which in a shape of an envelope and this is an IL aspirin incorrect, IL implant incorrect, hydrodissection incorrect, is capsular excess. What you are doing is tearing the capsule in a single fluid motion like this. This we call a CCC. This is, not, this is the best form of opening the anterior capsule, which you have to do to remove the cataracts through the anterior capsule opening and implant dial in the capsular bag. This stands for a circular continuous capsular excess. Tearing the capsule in a single fluid motion like that is the capsular rexus which you can see here see this is how we're tearing the capsule in a single fluid motion we're tearing the capsule like this so the capsule comes out in a single fluid motion this is important to for us to take the cathode out and to place the intraocular lens very well identify the image and you can see this clearly this brown ring on top of the lens here this brown ring is because we call it the vosseous ring we'll discuss this again in a short while the vosseous ring occurs when you get hit in the eye the trauma question so this is what happens as you get hit in the eye. So the iris, it hits against the lens capsule. It is a lens capsule, and on the lens capsule it creates a ring of pigment like this, which causes the vosseous ring. And you see this beautiful vosseous ring here that you see. This is a sign of old trauma as the iris touches the lens capsule and imprints its pupillary margin on top of the lens surface, anterior capsule. And this is the famous vosseous ring. You should all recognize this. In the exam if it's asked. Next question is where is the lesion located in the optic pathway which can cause the given visual field defect and you see here we've got a field defect here so both the temporals are gone which means bitemporal hemianopia you know when the bitemporal hemianopia means that both the nasal fibers have to be damaged you all recover know that the visual field damage always occurs due to opposite retinal fibers or not so bitemporal means Binasal damage and binasal damage can take place in only one place where the two nasal fibers come close together, which is the optic chasm. Again, choice A. We all should have got this. It is optic chasm. You can see here. See two nasal fibers in blue here. See, they come here like this and they come here like this. And then the chasm and the crossover is not the crossover. So at the optic chasm, if there's a very small lesion, it can compress the two nasal fibers and be leading to bitemporal hemianopia and that is why this is a chiasmal lesion and the most common chiasmal lesion to cause bitemporal hemianopia is the pituitary adenoma. We've all got this right. So answer here is optic chiasma and the most common lesion to cause a chiasmal lesion to cause a bi bitemporal hemianopia as we see here is a pituitary adenoma. Which of the following is not seen in keratoconus? So let's look at the signs of keratoconus and see irregular stigmatism. That is seen correct. You remember in keratoconus because the surface of the cornea is not very regular. So light rays glance off here and there like this. Irregular is called irregular stigmatism. Munson sign. Yes, Munson sign. You do see it. What is that? You hold it like this. As you may look down. As you look down, you will find the lower lid forms a cone or a notch or indentation of the lower lid on looking down is the Munson sign this is also seen and scissoring reflex in retinoscope is also seen when you retinoscope you will find the instead of retinoscope or going against or with the rule like this it goes like this okay look at that this is the scissoring reflex that you see in retinoscopy which is so typical one of very early signs of keratoconus the answer here is hab style gentlemen this is the answer Habstriatis, which is seen in congenital glaucoma, and you see, look at these parallel railway tracks here, typically appearing, and there's a rupture of desmus membrane because of raised intraocular pressure, stretching the desmus membrane and appearing as parallel tracks. This is a habstriatis. This is not seen in keratoconus, and you see here the Munson sign. We ask when look down, you can see what is happening to the lower lid. The lower lid forms almost triangle like a notch as it gets compressed and depressed by the cone here. So the answer here is Habstri. Okay, so please be careful. Which of them is not seen? You have to be careful about these questions. Which of them is not seen? All of them are true except which of the most likely, least likely, most unlikely, least unlikely. Okay, so you have to get hold of these terminologies also. It's no point if you can't even understand the question. How will you understand, uh, write the answers? No, it's very, very important. So please, ladies and gentlemen, spend some time on reading the question, at least not once, but not twice, but thrice, I would say, read the question. Most of the time, 
the answers are given in the question itself. Very well, which the following is incorrect about the given condition. And what we see here is a triangular encroachment of the conjunctiva. So we all know by the multiple times that we have seen this condition, this is called as pterygium, is it not? Which means a bird's wing. Bird's wing. So is it an we need what is incorrect here, right? So let's look at that. Is an elastoid degeneration of the conjunctiva is correct. It is an elastoid degeneration of the conjunctiva. Elastoid degeneration is a kind of pathological damage to the conjunctiva. Because of head, neck and body is also correct. This is the neck, this is the head and this is the body. And two types, progressive or regressive is also correct. One pterygium progresses, the other is there but does not progress, we call it regressive. And what is incorrect, which is what we want to know, is the simple excision can result in reduction of 95% of recurrence is incorrect. Remember, simple excision, the high rate of recurrence almost, the recurrence is almost 70%, okay. And simple excision does not reduce in 95 recurrence at all. In fact, it causes a recurrence rate of very high, almost 70-75%. So, this is incorrect. So, what we do, we do not do simple excision. What we do is excision with, excision with conjunctival autograft. So, first you excise it and from the other eye of the same patient, take out a little bit of conjunctiva and you stick it here either by tape or with, uh, with glue or with sutures. So, simple excision does have a very high recurrence and so what we do is not an excision but excision with conjunctival autograft and we can see here that after having taken out, you see this is the conjunctiva which is borrowed from the other eye of the patient and that's why it's called autograft and placed it here on the area of the excision so that there is no space for the to go back in.